from Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 69, recorded on June 11, 2025. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. Hello again, Paul. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase in important health topics. Boy, I, I, I don't think you realized what we'd be doing when you started this Substack, did you? <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't realize we would be in the midst of watching our entire public health infrastructure being torn to shreds. No, I didn't imagine that. Today, we're going to talk about Paul's recent column called The COVID Vaccine Pregnancy Flip-Flop. So, Paul, why are pregnant women no longer recommended to get a COVID vaccine? Go back from the beginning. Okay, so in December of 2020, when our committee, the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee, was considering Pfizer's vaccine and Moderna's vaccine, um, those vaccine trials were done excluding pregnant people. So you couldn't be pregnant to be in those trials. Um, nonetheless, interestingly, there were 36 pregnant people who were either in a vaccine or placebo group, 18 in the vaccine group, 18 in the placebo group, not enough to make any uh, statements about safety or efficacy. And so when that vaccine was then, then uh, uh, authorized, so emergency use authorization, what typically happens is if there aren't uh, groups that are studied, is the CDC will say this vaccine is contraindicated for pregnancy because pregnant people haven't been adequately studied. But they didn't say that this time. What they said was that a pregnant person could reasonably choose to get this vaccine. And if you make that choice, please enter this V-safe surveillance system, which is kind of an iPhone-based system where you report on a weekly basis how things are going with your pregnancy and then carry you through delivery and how things went with your neonate to see whether there was any problems. Um, and very quickly, um, 4,000 people were part of that system. And, and within months after that, it was more than 70,000 people were part of that system. So that enabled Tom Shimabukura at the CDC to gather data to see whether there were any complications with the pregnancy, like eclampsia or preeclampsia or gestational diabetes, and any problem with the with the newborn child. And there weren't. And so with that, the CDC went from a, you could reasonably choose to get this vaccine to urgently recommending the vaccine. And the reason they did that was because you knew in 2020 that if you were pregnant you, and you had COVID, you were far more likely to be hospitalized, far more likely to go to the intensive care unit and be ventilated, and far more likely to die as compared to if you weren't pregnant and had COVID. And so... Um, Therefore, uh, for that reason, uh, they had an urgent recommendation. And so that's the way it stood. And so pregnancy became, not surprisingly, a high-risk factor until recently. So why weren't pregnant women included in the original mRNA vaccine trials? Is that standard not to have uh, pregnant women in those? They should have been. I think at that time, you certainly knew that pregnancy was a complication not or a high-risk factor, not only for a respiratory disease like COVID, but other respiratory diseases as well, because it is to some extent an immune-compromised state. They should have included them. I think they were wrong not to include them. And so tell, tell me again, as the pandemic proceeded, what, what adverse outcomes did we see in, in pregnant women? So pregnant women um, were much more likely to suffer, for example, uh, eclampsia, uh, premature uh, delivery, stillbirths, um, and, and then uh, they were much more likely, the, 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 the person themselves, to be hospitalized, much more likely to be, had to go to the intensive care unit, and much more likely to die. It, it, um, mm -hmm. it was something that needed to be prevented, and that's why pregnancy became a high-risk medical condition, where whenever we talked about uh, high-risk groups, pregnancy was always included in, that, in those groups. So is this true also for other infectious diseases as well? Yes, other respiratory diseases as well. And that's why when um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. stood up in, um, on May 27th and said that, um, that he no longer considered um, healthy young children or pregnant people to be a high-risk group. I couldn't be more pleased to announce that as of today, the COVID vaccine for healthy children and healthy pregnant women 
has been removed from the CDC recommended immunization schedule. We became the only country in the world not consider, to consider pregnancy a high risk group. What did it mean when CDC in 2020 said pregnant women could reasonably choose to get the vaccine? What does that mean? I think what it really meant is they wanted pregnant people to get the vaccine. But it was hard to make that recommendation, given that we didn't have any data. And so what they, they did by setting up this V-safe surveillance system, they knew that they could very quickly follow, and, and really within four months, I mean, by April, you had data on many pregnant women who had made that choice and could then compare them to mm -hmm. a pregnant women who, uh, who either didn't get the vaccine or, or women of the same age who, uh, reproductive age, but weren't pregnant, but got COVID. So based on these observations, uh, some, some 4,000 women decided to get vaccinated, right? That's right, very quickly, yes. And, and there were no issues amongst them, correct? Right, it, it was, uh, there were, were no, by getting a vaccine, you pose no risk to your pregnancy and no risk to your uh, unborn child. So it was safe and it was effective, just what you'd hope for. So not too long ago, in, in uh, May, actually this year, 2025, in a New England Journal of Medicine paper, McCary and Prasad, who were both involved with the FDA, uh, made COVID vaccine recommendations, right? What did that include? Right, so Marty McCarry is the FDA commissioner. Vinay Prasad is the um, head of the Centers for Biologics Evaluation and Research, CBER. And they published a paper listing um, high-risk groups. So they considered anybody over 65 to be in a high-risk group for severe COVID. And then for those less than 65, they listed like 23 different high-risk groups, one of which was pregnancy, as it should have been. And then a few days later, RFK Jr. removes pregnancy from this list and says he could not be more pleased, which seems to me a very odd thing to say. Yeah, what was also odd was that you had standing next to him, Marty McCary, who had just published a paper a few days earlier saying that pregnancy was a high risk group. Now he's standing next to the Secretary of Health and Human Services who says it's not a high risk group. So which is it? That's the part I don't get. They just publish this paper and then they stand next to him smiling as he makes this ridiculous omission. It showed that he was willing to essentially subvert something he thought was true, which is that pregnancy was a high-risk group, to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, who didn't. And, and remember, every country in this world, including recommendations by the World Health Organization, considers pregnancy to be a high-risk group. We're the only country that doesn't. So why didn't McCary and Prasad object to him? Are they afraid of losing their jobs? I don't know. You'll have to ask them. Maybe you can get them on your podcast. Oh, yeah. I'm sure they would like to do that. <laughs> now, normally, how would a decision like this be made to exclude uh, a certain condition from vaccination recommendations? Right. So normally, um, what you would do is you would bring it up in front of the ACIP, you, the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices. Let's say RFK Jr. wanted to consider whether or not healthy young children or pregnant people needed to still have be considered uh, as in the case of healthy children for a primary vaccine or in case of pregnant uh, people for a vaccine every time they're, they're pregnant. That would go to the ACIP and, and the ACIP would review data, have a discussion and then vote on it. And then it would go to the CDC and the people at the CDC would then review those data and also decide whether or not they wanted to, to take that recommendation or not. This wasn't done that way. This was done just as an edict, as if stone tablets had been handed down from Mount Sinai. Um, there, was, there was no discussion. And it, the irony of all this is that Robert F. Kennedy Jr., when he took this position as head of HHS, said that he is going to usher in an era of radical transparency. And this is the exact opposite of that. Decisions are made behind closed doors without input from professional societies or advisory committees or the public. He also said he wasn't going to take away people's vaccines, right? My position is that if you want a vaccine, you ought to be able to get a vaccine. And now he has. He has functionally done that. I think by, by for example, not making um, the, uh, the vaccine for pregnant people a, a routine recommendation. Um, if you look on the adult immunization schedule for the CDC now under pregnancy for COVID vaccine, it's a little gray box. 
And then if you look at the legend, it says no recommendation. So, so now what? Is our insurance companies going to cover it? Unlikely. Um, or will it be a liability issue um, for, for a physician mm-hmm. who, for example, gives that vaccine? And there's, there's an untoward effect, whether real or imagined, or whether coincidental or causal. Um, would they be covered? you know, by insurance. So I think he's made it much, much less likely that a pregnant person in this country will get vaccinated, thus putting them at unnecessary risk. Please know this. SARS-CoV-2 virus is going to be circulating for decades, if not longer. This virus is still out there. Pregnancy in this country is no different than pregnancy in every other country. You're still going to be at some level immune compromised. And so why did we make this decision? It makes absolutely no sense. Well, it's a, as you have said many times before, it's, a, it's from a zealot who doesn't believe in vaccines, doesn't believe in infectious diseases. And we sh- I want to emphasize again, every other country in the world thinks that pregnancy uh, is a risk factor for severe COVID, right? That's right. So a person with uh, no public health background, no epidemiology, a lawyer and a politician has made this decision Unilaterally, we are now in the era of science and public health by edict, Paul, not by committee. And we're in an era of science denialism. I think people simply declare their own truths, including scientific truths, and we will suffer this. So practically, what do you think will be the outcomes of uh, pregnant women not being able to get vaccinated against COVID? What you'd like to see is you would like to see um, what is inevitable happening, which is that a pregnant person um, gets covid suffers severely or dies, and then then there's a lawsuit against the federal government saying that I couldn't get this, I couldn't afford the vaccine, uh, and I couldn't I couldn't pay for it, and my insurance company wouldn't pay for it, and my doctor was scared to give it, and and now you know I've suffered, or in the case of the family, this this person has died, and they they sue the federal government for, for what should be an obviously winnable lawsuit, which is that every other country considers this to be a high risk condition, we don't. Uh, you made it much more difficult for me to get this vaccine, and I'm going to sue you for it. There's a lot of outcry over this among public health officials and scientists, isn't there? Especially the the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. They were really angry. I mean, they put out a very pointed statement mm-hmm. about how this puts uh, pregnant people at unnecessary risk. So do you think this is just the first step and eventually uh, RFK Jr. will remove all vaccines from the recommended list? I know he he has a particular um, hatred for Gardasil, for example. I think his his goal is to to make sure no vaccine is ever mandated, for for example, for school entry. I think what happened with COVID for children is we moved from a routine recommendation for children to shared clinical decision making, which is much softer. And it in many ways sends the message that the vaccine isn't so important or could reasonably con- mm. be considered to be not important, thus putting children in harm's way. I think he, he would like all vaccines to be that, shared clinical decision making, so that there's no actual routine recommendation for any vaccine. Therefore, no vaccine could be mandated. That, that will cause definitely a, lessen, a lesser use of vaccines and put us all at greater risk because he believes that vaccines... Are, are, are doing far more harm than good. He has said that in many different venues, in many different ways. And so he's a zealot. He believes vaccines are doing harm. He will do everything he can to make them less available, less affordable, and more feared. That's who he is. But, you know, removing mandates is different from removing a vaccine from the recommended list. Remember, it's a recommendation by CDC that can't be enforced. So why, I can understand if he doesn't want mandates, but just to remove it. And many people would like to have these vaccines. It doesn't seem appropriate. You're right. It's much worse. Although I, I want to put in a plug for mandates. I mean, if you, I'm old enough to remember the measles epidemics in the 1970s, where it was massive measles epidemics, also in sort of late 80s, early 90s. It wasn't until mm-hmm. we really enforced school mandates that we were able to get those, uh, those outbreaks under control. There is a value. I mean, in theory, you shouldn't need them. In theory, people look at the data, they realize vaccines are a value and they get them. But that's not the world we're currently living in. And sometimes you have to um, force people to, to, or at least compel people to get something that helps them. Yeah, public health doesn't work if everyone makes their own choice, right? That's right. That's what's happening now. We'll put the link to Paul's column in the show notes so you can read everything and look at the references as well. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.